Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd, and uh, we're well into our series this quarter. I'm not going to talk about administrative details. If you have questions, send them by email. Um, quickly, next week's speaker is the second of our three Berkeley speakers this quarter, and he's a cognitive psychologist. Uh, Steve Palmer has been in the cognitive sciences program there for a long time, and his topic is one that's sort of interesting because when people think about doing interface design, they often say, oh, well, it's things like the colors you use, right? Should you have a green screen or a blue screen? And that's really something like for somebody who's an interior decorator or a graphic designer or something. Well, Steve has actually studied colors. So it's not a question of what do you, what do you like or what does he like or what does a designer like, but what do we know scientifically about the ways that people, and this includes people across different cultures, actually respond to different colors and how can we make use of that scientific knowledge in, in design. So it's, it's an interesting take on, the, on that problem. Um, this week we have Ross Bodick, who is in the computer science department and is looking at tools for programmers. And most of us when we think of tools for programmers are thankful that we have something that helps us with our semicolons. Um, and that's great. I mean, you want that, right? But his, his basic point is that's not enough, that you need tools that help you with the, the interesting part of programming, uh, not just taking care of the, the details. So that's what he'll be talking about today. Thank you, Terry. So since uh, we mostly solved the semicolon problem, I want to look at something more ambitious. Not, some, not clear it's something that we can actually do, but it is a work coming out of programming languages, program synthesis that sort of promises how the programmer could communicate with the computer and use the abundant computing power to actually make the cognitive task of programming somewhat easier. And uh, before I tell you what that vision is and what are the partial results so far, I want to sort of step back and do a reality check. Now I want to look at 30 years ago and, and examine a project that proposed something very interesting. It was a uh, programmer's apprentice project out of MIT, which showed you how actually programs would be developed if they succeed, the people at MIT. And so essentially, the idea was that the programmer would write the specification. What you see here is a specification of how to delete from a hash-based set. So you say after you delete value v, the result is a set that is what it was before, except minus that element v. So you need a specification so that you know what the program is supposed to do. And then the programmer develops what they call the plan. It's essentially high-level program. Think of Python-level programming, set comprehensions, but even a little bit higher. They had sort of natural language features in mind as well, but that doesn't matter very much. The point is that the programmer would say, well, I have these three steps in mind, first, second, and the third, and essentially that describes the three main steps of deleting from the hash table. And then the apprentice would come in and say, well, I'm sorry, I can't verify that the three steps actually compute the specification correctly. And what is more interesting, it actually gives you a counterexample showing when this actually doesn't work. So the, the, the apprentice, which you know, is humbly called apprentice, actually does check after the programmer and gives you examples where the program is incorrect, and that's extremely helpful to know when the code breaks and get some description of it. Then the programmer fixes the plan, and then the programmer proceeds to write what you could call low-level code. Here, given in list, but it doesn't matter. This is the code that actually does implement everything as opposed to the plan which was thought of only as a design, as a sort of specification between the correctness specification and the implementation. And again, the apprentice says, well, it doesn't quite work because this code is not consistent with your plan. And again, it says where the problem exists and makes a suggestion for correctness. So it would correct this into that. And the programmer says, sure, correct it. And the apprentice corrects the code. So that was the vision 30 years ago. And uh, it would be good to have a reality check whether actually some of that was accomplished before we go on and try to do something more ambitious. It turns out that a lot of it can be done today. We have, uh, thanks to model checking and static analysis tools that can look at programs, understand whether they meet specifications. Perhaps these specifications are not in terms of complete behavior, but some partial behavior. They can find traces showing when the bug happens, and they can also suggest what the bugs are. Perhaps not, these tools usually work on lower level code rather than these higher level plans, but once the community realizes that bugs in programs 
written in Python and such actually matter, then perhaps those tools will move to those programs as well. So the vision for 30 years is to make this communication between the programmer and the, the, the tool a little bit more semantically rich. Here, essentially, the tool was just checking by the programmer and correcting mistakes, which is great, but I wonder whether you could push it a little bit further. And I'll show you five systems that uh, are all based on a similar idea of partial programs. And those systems give us some hope that you could probably communicate uh, with the synthesizer, with the tool a little bit better. And the synthesizer could actually do some thinking for the programmer rather than check correctness for him. So I'll show you five systems. Uh, uh, I'll show you two good ones and three from my research group. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll go through various problems with such communication in, in, in uh, between the programmer and the synthesizer. So the first system is ALISP. Uh, it, it tries to attack the problem of implementing AI engines, sort of AI agents that, that you can think of the game playing <coughs> opponents that sit in the computer and play the game against you. And it turns out that uh, in a typical game, the state explosion is so large that machine learning algorithms cannot efficiently learn these agents. Uh, and therefore, these agents are typically written by, by programmers themselves. The problem on the programmer side, if you choose the solution of implementing it with the programmer, is that programmers, even after months of effort, cannot develop agents that are decent and they lose to human opponents, typically. So their solution was to divide that labor between uh, something done by the programmer, something done by the tool, and the division is along the lines of, well, the programmer specifies the strategy of the game-playing agent and the system then fills in the low-level details. And uh, it is done based on the reward function, sort of by embedding the, uh, the partial program into the environment, into the game environment, the machine learning fills in the details. And the synthesizer itself that you do here is based on hierarchical reinforcement learning, but that's not so important in the story presented here. So what is it that the programmer typically provides in, in ALISP? It is the strategy for playing the game. It is something that is difficult for the tool to discover but it's something that the programmer has very easy understanding about by just understanding uh, the rules of the game and thinking about possible strategies. So a typical strategy <laughs> may be first train a few peasants, then once you have trained them, send them collect resources, which could be either wood or gold. Then when you have enough wood, you reassign them to build barracks. When barracks are done, you train footmen. When you have footmen, you attack, but you attack in groups rather than individually. That's the strategy. And it looks like this is a complete agent, but of course it's not. The actual decisions on how many you need to train, when you reassign them and under what conditions, is actually what the machine learning algorithm underneath will do. And here is the partial program in ALISP that would express what I showed you on the previous slide. And uh, it's in, in LISP, but perhaps all you need to know that uh, here is three functions that are sort of crucial in the strategy. And each of them have the construct which they uh, developed in a lisp, you could call it choose construct, which is effectively uh, a whole that is completed by the by the synthesizer. In each of those, they, using machine learning, figure out the function that does the right decision at each of these steps. So what are those steps? Here we have a loop that for a single peasant iterates and chooses for each agent whether it gets gold or it gets wood, depending on the state of the environment. Then here, when you actually go and get wood, you need to choose which of the many forests you choose from. Presumably one that still has wood and is close by to that peasant. And then here is navigation where you are choosing the direction in which the peasant takes the next step. And that presumably is a function of the location of the peasant and other peasants. You don't want him to walk in the direction of hitting somebody else. So one example of a function that may be learned is you compare the x coordinate of the peasant and the destination and then if the comparison is like that, you go west, you check for conflicts on other uh, locations in the board so that you don't run into somebody. And this is essentially the partial program and the function in this corner here is what is completed by their synthesizer. The second system is uh, our synthesizer that we call uh, Sketch. You could say the Sketch is a language for uh, programmer assisted synthesis. And we've been working on the project for uh, uh, a few years before the sketch actually appeared. Uh, we wanted to help the programmer write high-performance crypto codes. Uh, 
And our approach was to do it sort of in classical program synthesis, which is you take a specification, you come up with a set of rewrite functions that transform it, optimize it until you get something really fast. But we knew that it was difficult to come up with these rewrite rules, these optimization functions. So we allowed the programmer to leave holes in them. And those uh, optimization functions, the transformations, would be completed by the synthesizer to be correct, to be semantics preserving. That turned out to be still very difficult because programmers don't typically like to think in terms of transforming program from one shape to another. So after we saw ALIS, it sort of clicked and we realized that the idea of these partial programs is how we want to implement. We want to give programmers a program that has hole in them and this way they can express the resulting code. We do not really want to give them uh, transformation functions because that's what they find difficult to reason about. So the problem in Sketch is uh, slightly different than in ALISP. We, uh, we, we think of the problem as, well, you're often given an algorithm that is often expressible in 10 line pseudocode, but when you actually implement it with all the corner cases and the data structure implementations, you may end up with a thousand line program. And that's full of devious corner cases. Um, so our solution was that the programmer writes a program that is incomplete, again, either contains holes that need to be completed or provides ingredients to the synthesizer and the synthesizer then assembles them together to give you the right solution. Of course, there needs to be a way for the synthesizer to know what needs to be computed. And that's our reference implementation. So for most of these programs that are high in performance, there is usually a slow, easy to implement, easy to validate implementation that serves as our reference implementation. And the synthesizer is based on inductive synthesis implemented with a set solver. But again, at the level of the interface with the programmer, this is quite irrelevant here. So let me give you an example of how the programmer would communicate his insight. The whole idea is that the insight can be expressible with this partial program and that uh, the mechanics can be left out as some sort of a hole in that sketch, that partial program. So we'll use a linked list data structure as an example. And it has two sentinels here to simplify the corner cases. These are the blue nodes. And what we look at is how to implement the remove function. So this is a list of nodes. Each of them have a key, and you want to implement remove. In the sequential case, it's easy. You find the node you want to remove, say C. You flip the pointer around it, and the garbage collector then collects that node. When you want to do it concurrently, it's a little bit harder, especially if you want to do it with high performance. So let's assume that. The first insight the, performer, uh, the programmer has to obtain high performance is that he wants to do it with, with fine-grained locking, which means whenever remove is done, we are not locking the entire list. We are locking individual nodes. And the second insight, which could be obtained perhaps by trying it with our system first with a single lock, is that you need to have two locks. Otherwise, the threads that are working on this, on this list could get ahead ahead of each other and perhaps opt, uh, get into races that will make you drop some elements that you do not want to have deleted. So here is how this two log structure may work. And so you are actually always grabbing one node before you go to the next one and log that. And only then you release this log so that there is always one log uh, uh, held by the thread. And this way, the threads cannot get ahead of each other. The question is, of course, how you implement the locking so that no, no dangerous races can uh, occur. So the programmer will start with what is essentially a sequential implementation of, of the remove method. And what it does, it gets the current pointer, which points to the head. It has another one which keeps the previous pointer, and it iterates until it finds that value in the list. And it keeps another pointer just in case the, data, the algorithm needs three pointers. Here, what you see is just advancing of the pointer. And then at the end, when we happen to find that, uh, that node, the removal happens. So this is the sequential version. And now the programmer will add essentially directives for the synthesizer to turn this into a concurrent one. And the first one says, well, I know that before I get into the loop, I need to lock some of those nodes. But the programmer doesn't know exactly which node to lock. And he says, you know, his understanding at that point says, well, I know that it is either current or current.next. And here is our language construct here for instructing the synthesizer what are the choices. Essentially, a small regular expression that gives you the set of expressions that could be the arguments for the lock. And then, at the end, the programmer sort of has the understanding that, uh, well, we need to unlock something. But again, he doesn't know whether it should unlock current or current.next, previous or previous.next. <coughs> 
Similarly, in the loop, he knows that in each iteration he needs to lock something and unlock something, but he doesn't know under what condition this will happen and what is the location, which is what is the node that needs to be locked. And we express this again as a sort of set of expressions. So the comparison would be either equal or non-equal on current or previous, optional for by next, dot null, same for the right-hand side. And the location similarly would be the variables in scope optionally followed by next. So currently we spelled out this, this, this uh, language of expressions, but you couldn't envision how you could just take the variables from the scope of the program and use them to generate expressions. And finally, uh, the programmer understands that in order to make this data structure correct in multi-threaded environment, these statements here needs to be ordered just right because there is no locking here, there is no mutex, and so they need to happen in the right order so that the data structure is correct. And uh, here is the result of the synthesis. Uh, the synthesizer found exactly what needs to be locked and under what condition. It ordered the statements correctly, and it also did the right thing here before the loop and after the loop. So this is how we envision the programmer to collaborate with the synthesizer. I think the whole premise is that if there is an insight, then it can be expressed actually in the code directly. And if there is mechanics, then it can be provided as some sort of ingredients for the synthesizer to work with. So the language itself is very simple. There are essentially just two constructs. And it is what you could call an elementary hole. It's a, it's a placeholder for a constant. The synthesizer replaces that with a constant value. And it replaces in such a way that the function after it is completed actually implements the specification. So this implements clause binds these two functions together. And effectively, this implements is nothing but a little syntactic sugar on top of assertion. So you could actually use assertions as well in the programs to specify what the sketch after it is completed should be doing. And the completion here, of course, is just replacing this double question mark hole with, with the value 1. And this looks like an extremely low-level construct, but all the other constructs I showed you on the previous slide, such as choosing from a regular expression, describing the set of expressions, reordering statements, is easily implemented as a syntactic sugar on top of that. Um, so this is the, the language. Now, how are these two systems, the ALISP and, uh, and, and Sketch, similar? Well, in both cases, we are talking about synthesizing programs from partial programs. And the synthesizer receives two things, a partial program and some correctness criterion, obtains a completion, and from that completion, in usually very simple way, you create the complete program by merging the partial program and its completion. And in the case of sketch, the, well, the partial program is what we call a sketch. The correctness criterion is a reference implementation. And the whole values, the constants, actually then give you the final program. In the case of ALISP, there is the ALICE partial program, which you saw with those choose placeholders. There is a reward function that describes what is a correct program or a program that is better than others. And then there are these learn choice functions, which actually need another description of sort of what sort of language they come from. And they are operating over a space of these programs. So essentially, the, their sketch, their ALICE program contains variables, and these learn functions can operate over those variables. So. At this point, it would be good to say what actually these partial programs uh, give you. It seems that uh, you could achieve the same effect just iterating over the space of all programs in a given language and finding one that meets the correctness criterion. And yes, in principle, you could do it, but that would typically not scale. So if you look at the simple example of the concurrent data structure, uh, if you wrote a grammar, context-free grammar, and or, you know, explore the derivations that give you programs that are large enough to contain that correct data structure, that would lead to probably 10 to the 30 candidates. And even if you were able to validate each candidate in one CPU cycle, I th it would probably take roughly the age of the universe. So exploring all programs is not feasible. Uh, and this is what Sketch gives you. It not only allows the programmer to communicate the insight, but mainly from the solvability point of view, it reduces that space significantly. So for that sketch, the space is about 10 to the 9, so smaller relative by the standards of other examples we have. But the space is already so small that if you could do a validation uh, 
in one second, which seems about right for these concurrent uh, data structures, then you can find the correct program in 10 to 100 days. That's still not quite interactive enough. And here is where our algorithm comes that uh, I don't have time to talk about today, but essentially, given the space of candidates described by the sketch, it uses constraint solving to find a candidate that meets the specification. And it does it by iteratively through counterexample search, finding those inputs, inputs to the sketch that sufficiently describe the, essentially the problem. It finds in the case of the data structure just three inputs, such that if the synthesizer can find a candidate that is correct on those inputs, it turns out that it is correct also on other inputs, as is then validated by a model checker. And by this counterexample guided synthesis, we, we were able to get from essentially 10 to 100 days to about, uh, it doesn't say here, to about a minute for the concurrent data structures. But mostly it allows you to go to much higher spaces. So if the sketch describes sort of candidates of 10 to the 800, we often still can solve it and find the correct candidate. So, so what you saw so far is that partial programs may be a way for the programmer to communicate what he or she knows about the desired program and for a synthesizer to come up with those details that are missing. Of course, there is the problem of where the specification of correctness comes from. Very often, writing that is much harder than writing the implementation itself. So we need to really look at that problem. Uh, unit tests or having some set of input-output pairs is one solution that often actually works surprisingly well in practice. But the two next projects that I'll show you go much further in the direction of how to obtain specifications to guide that, that search. Um, so the first tool is by Tessa Lau, who did it in her PhD at uh, University of Washington. And what it does, it tries to make it easier to uh, create macros, editor macros for non-programmers. Uh, so as you know, editor macros try to automate tasks that are often repeated by end users. And, but writing those macros is not easy. It's error prone and programmers often do not know the editor language. The, the problems are familiar. So their solutions are that the user will demonstrate uh, what sort of editing task he or she has in mind. And he will repeat those demonstrations until the macro is learned unambiguously. And uh, unambiguous here I'll define in terms of, well, whether all plausible macros that meet those demonstrations would transform the rest of the file in the same way. Once that has happened, there is sufficient demonstration and we actually can proceed with the execution of the macro on the rest of the file. So here is the setup. Imagine you want to translate uh, the bibliography file on the left to the bibliography file on the right. And you do it by demonstrating, which means you just start editing uh, one entry at a time. And each entry generates a trace. And the trace or a demonstration essentially is a sequence of operations. And in each step, you say where the cursor is in the buffer in terms of coordinates, what is the state of the buffer, which means the, essentially the content of the file, and what potentially what is also the state of the clipboard. And then as the programmer moves, the cursor moves as well. And the goal is to take this set of demonstrations and obtain a macro that uh, looks like this. Rather than seeing intermediate program states, what we see are macro instructions that refer to symbolic arguments, symbolic in the sense that we are not moving the cursor to a particular location, but we are expressing the desired location of the cursor in terms of some sort of string that is used to move the cursor to the next location in the, in the buffer. So how does uh, their synthesizer work? Well, essentially there is a partial program that is hard-coded by the designer of that system. I'll express it here in our sketch language, and this is approximately what they do. Um, <coughs> so they say, well, the macro that we learn has some number of instructions to be determined by the synthesizer, and each instruction can be either a move or insert or cut or copy. And then you need to synthesize the arguments for those instructions. For insert, what string you want to insert or at what indentation you want to insert it. And then for location, there is sort of another sub-language that decides where you may want to move. And this could be given as row or columns based on some prefix, word offset, you, you, you got it. And essentially, based on demonstrations, you then try to find a set of solutions. You could say arguments to this macro template that are correct with respect to these 
observed uh, demonstrations. Another tool from my group looks at a different uh, problem that is sort of, sort of higher in the abstraction hierarchy. The problem is about programming on top of huge object-oriented libraries. So I'll tell you a story that uh, motivates this. A few years ago, I wanted to uh, give a homework assignment in my compiler class, and I wanted to do it all in Eclipse. I knew that Eclipse comes with a Java parser because it analyzes Java files. And so I figured, well, in an hour, I should know how to uh, give students a way of parsing a Java file, obtaining the abstract syntax tree on which they can do their the compilation and analysis. And it turned out that it took about four days, and each day I could only work on the problem of only an hour because it was so uh, mentally demanding to find a piece of code, two lines, that actually did open the Java file and parsed it. And uh, why is that? Well, uh, I knew that I had the handle to the file, the, uh, the file which actually contained the Java file, and I wanted to get an AST node. The resulting code was here, and uh, there are three reasons why it was difficult to find that code by hand. And the first one was that there were actually two levels of file handles. I expected only one, and that really affected my search through the API documentation. Then there were two classes. One of them I sort of figured out quickly that was the AST class, but the other one, Java Core, I didn't realize may be necessary for the task. And finally, uh, when I resorted to grepping, grep was not useful either because the function parse compilation unit doesn't actually return AST node, it returns a subclass. And so grep, grepping for AST node did not produce this function as well. So the problem was that grep was not aware of the type system, didn't understand subtyping, and it didn't give me the right thing. So the problem is that you have an API with hundreds of thousands of methods, and you need to find the code that does the task that you have in mind. Um, the solution that, that we came up with was based on uh, one crucial observation that majority of these questions can be actually phrased as a query that is a pair. Pair which says, I have a type of a particular kind, for example, foo, and I want to obtain a value of type bar. And this sort of generalized type conversion can often describe what you want to implement as a programmer. And the second observation was that most of these queries, the going from have type to want type, can actually be uh, expressed or solved by what we call jungloid, essentially a chain expressions of function calls. Right? So a very simple syntactic expression often provided the right answer to those queries. When it didn't, you could actually decompose the synthesis problem into several jungloids that would then connect into the appropriate tree or a DAG or a general graph. And that connection, the decomposition, would easily be done by the programmer in most of the cases. And the synthesizer, based on this observation, was very simple. You just build a huge graph where you have one node per class, and an edge will connect to classes if there exists a method that can convert, so to speak, from one class to another, from instance of that class to another. And so that jungloid that you want to synthesize is just a directed path in that graph. And the third observation is a heuristic for ranking them, and that says that the shortest path is most likely the desired one. And there are a few other observations about the domain which makes those heuristics better. The interface to the programmer actually is not in the form of the query. That would be too tedious. So what we came up with was to piggyback the synthesizer on uh, top of the autocompletion that you see in modern IDEs. So imagine that your cursor is here, and so you want to come up with a uh, proper initialization of the variable AST. And the first thing the IDE does, it looks at the variables in scope, determines its type, and it gives us our want type. Then it looks at the other variables in scope and their types, it gives us the have types. It issues the two queries constructed this way to the synthesizer. That produces jungloids which are then ranked and displayed in the familiar way to the programmer. And this is not the best picture, but essentially what you see here, in each line here we have one candidate, and they look the same, but if we saw the right-hand side here, we would see they actually differ in the concrete types that are uh, the arguments. Turns out that this iEditor and iFile is, a, is an interface. So it, there are many implementations of those interfaces from which you need to choose, and you do it by going through these examples and choosing, choosing the right one. So, are these two systems, Smart Edit and Prospector, actually examples of partial programming? And if yes, how do they differ from the 
simple template I showed you initially. Uh, well, so here is the template for partial programming. You have a correctness criterion, partial program and completion. And these essentially fall into the same category too, except what is correctness differs slightly. So in the case of the smart edit, the demonstrations provide part of the correctness criteria, not the complete correctness criteria, but, but part of it. Essentially, you are saying by giving demonstration that you're only interested in programs that meet those demonstrations. The output of the synthesizer is actually a set of macro parameters. One element of that set is defines one candidate program. And then you determine whether uh, you have converged by running that macro determined by one set of macro parameters on input file. And then you do it for all the other macros. And if all of them produce the same file, you have converged. And you can run the rest of the uh, file through that learned macro. If you have not converged, then you go back and you ask the user for more demonstrations. In the case of Prospector, that correctness criterion even more distributed, you could say. The partial correctness criterion is given with the have one query. So essentially we say, well, the programs you synthesize need to be correct from the type a system point of view. This is not clearly a, uh, a criteria that fully you know, observationally describes the program you synthesize, but it is a very strong filter. Then the second part of the correctness condition is this shortest path observation, which says rank higher those jungloids that are shorter. And this provides the ranking, and finally the user comes here and selects from them the one that was actually intended. And this looks straightforward, but there is a deep observation here that if it is difficult to write a specification of correctness, then the sort of partial correctness specifications with heuristics on the ranking can provide a small enough list that user can actually, by selecting, specify the specification, right? By choosing what we want, we actually post fact or post synthesis specify what was the desired program. And in the case of programming over APIs, this is beneficial because imagine how you would formally specify that you want to open a Java file and obtain an AST for that. You would need to develop a lexicon for talking about what is a Java file and what is a correct AST. So this is a way of offloading some of that specification to a selection after the fact. So we saw several ideas for dealing with the problem of where does specification of correctness come from. And so you can have reference implementation. You can do unit testing, so have a set of input-output pairs. You can approximate, as in the prospector, you go from correctness to type safety plus some heuristics. And in the case of Smart Edit, we had uh, essentially asking the user to provide more demonstrations until we converge under some criterion. And that criterion was interesting because it was specific only to that input at hand rather than be more general. The macro that we synthesized didn't have to be correct for all possible uh, files in that bibliography format. So that made the whole process much easier. Of course, often other problems arise in this partial programming. And one of them is that Sometimes the insight to the, that the programmer has is too vague to actually be expressible uh, in a partial program. Sometimes you just don't understand enough to even write the program with holes in it. Because you don't even know what the key steps of the algorithms are, and therefore you cannot specify the holes that the synthesizer should complete for you. And uh, what would you do in such a situation in, in real life as a programmer? Well, as a student you would probably ask, your professor for a demonstration of the execution of the algorithm. You would perhaps look at an example in the textbook, seeing what steps the algorithm takes. And having seen those steps, you would then generalize from that example or from multiple to the actual algorithm that can handle any inputs. And the reason why this demonstration in the textbook or given by someone is useful that it decomposes the problem into smaller chunks. You then start thinking about implementing these individual steps rather than implementing the big algorithm. Sort of somebody gives you a strategy and then you fill in the tactics for individual statements. So it would be really good if the programmer could ask for a demonstration of the desired program and then start thinking in terms of the smaller steps that need to be implemented. But of course, and because that demonstration presumably would reveal the inside of the algorithm that needs to be implemented. But uh, who gives you that, that, that demonstration? You know, if you have no other human to ask for the demonstration, the, your only choice is that you implement a system, some sort of oracle that will demonstrate this for you. And this is what I want to talk about in the rest of the talk. 
how we can extend the idea of partial programming into uh, building a system that will give you demonstrations and how that may improve programming. So it will become clear why we call it angelic programming. So let me first tell you what sort of demonstration I may want to get from the system. Uh, I'll start with an example of inverting a linked list. So imagine you want to go from the linked list on the left to the one on the right. You want to reverse it. And this is a simple example, but it's already interesting to consider because clearly you could do it walking the list forward, walking the list backwards, and probably there are other alternatives how one could do it by decomposing it into sort of paralyzable chunks. And so if we could get the oracle to show us that the first step is to null this pointer, then flip the pointer in two, and then add a pointer from three to two, we would then know what the steps of the algorithm are, and we would in implement them in a sort of more separate fashion, we, because we would know what the steps are. So once you would see them, yes, you would implement them by mimicking these uh, non-deterministically created choices, which were chosen by the system such that the program, when it runs, actually achieves the correctness specification. Is that it does what we want. You would then mimic them with a deterministic program that doesn't need to rely on any oracle, but actually does the computation as we know it. But how do we create such an oracle to demonstrate this for us? So this program shows how to do it. We have a new operator here. You remember previously we had this question mark hole, which was replaced by the synthesizer with a constant, the constant that would make this program correct. Here we have this uh, choice operator, which is a, a non-deterministic construct corresponding to angelic non-determinism. Angelic non-determinism is one where the, the, the oracle chooses a value that doesn't play against you, but it gives you values that guarantees, when possible, that the execution of the program finishes and it finishes correctly. So the program needs to go all the way to the end and pass all the assertions. So what do you see here is, a, is an angelic program that demonstrates how you can invert a list. So here we are selecting a value, well the oracle is selecting a value that will iterate the loop just the right number of times. Here and here the oracle will return values that are pointers to nodes that exist in the execution of the program. So it will choose the pointer value that we are assigning into the next field of some other node. And by doing that, the right number of times, we are demonstrating how to reverse the linked list. In the end, we set the head of the list to again carefully chosen node, such that the reverse list is a reversal of the original list. This is our correctness check. And so when the oracle demonstrated that for us, we can then understand better how we would actually proceed and implement these angelic constructs deterministically. So we would presumably go ahead and introduce induction variables that would compute these pointers rather than having them angelically guessed by the system. So what we have, have here is a slight variation on uh, the partial programming. We have a correctness check and we have a partial program and we do have a completion too, but the completion does not complete the program into a final program, but it actually gives us a demonstration. The demonstration that should reveal something to us in the case of a linked list in which way we should be reversing it. So how do you actually program with this? This is a picture I just took in the lobby of uh, the Gates building on the way here. And uh, I'm not sure you can read it. It's by Niklas Wirt and he says that program construction consists of a sequence of refinement steps. In each step, a given task is broken up into a number of subtasks, and then you proceed. And this is essentially how you would proceed with these angels, that uh, given a specification that, in our case, it would be a set of input-output pairs. In fact, very often, you just need to get one input-output pair that is sufficiently interesting. You develop an angelic program that meets the specification. That program contains angels that just give you the right values. Maybe you can build on top of them other constructs, such as permutations and, and functions. Um, when you have the program, you look at each angel in that program and you think of it as a subtask that is currently computed angelically, but in the next step, you implement that angel with a more deterministic program. That program could itself be angelic and then you iterate until you are done with the program that is completely deterministic. And the result is a program with no angel, so a typical angelic program. So here it may be good to reflect what this, uh, what this construct here actually is, uh, this angelic choice. It's nothing else than 
the choice construct that Flo invented and put into Lisp later, which uh, the uh, Abelson Sussman book uses to illustrate non-determinism. This is exactly that. And in fact, one of our implementation that is not based on set solver is uh, using precisely the algorithm that uh, Floyd used in his Lisp. The only difference is that he used this construct to provide a nice abstraction on top of the search algorithm. So when you wanted to implement end queens, you didn't have to pollute your algorithms with the backtracking, but the backtracking would be nicely hidden under this choice operator. For us, this choice operator is used only during the development. So when you are done with developing your program, all these angels are gone. So we can afford to put a lot of computing power in the development process, which only need to work on small examples, small enough to give you the insight about the problem. But when the program is complete, the choice is gone. So the goal is not to come up with an abstraction that hides the search, but with something that essentially shows the programmer the steps of the development that provide hopefully insight on how the program should proceed. So, and another piece of perspective is how does this algorithmic synthesis, which is not based on derivation, but based on essentially exploring spaces, how does that compare to model checking? So model checking is an algorithmic approach to verification. You don't need to take a theorem prover and prove that it is correct, but instead you validate that the program is correct. Depending on the algorithm and the problem at hand, you can get full verification or just a check up to certain uh, input size. Partial programming is essentially algorithmic alternative to a deductive synthesis. Again, you are not deriving in a theorem prover, but instead you're exploring the spaces. And similar angelic programming is, uh, it differs in a similar respect, that so far angels have been used to simplify these deductive proofs, but here we actually make these angels executable and use them to obtain insight about the program that we want to implement. So I now have two examples that I could use to show how this angelic programming works out in practice. And one of them is about essentially programming with recursion and lists. And the other one looks at a complicated algorithm, the Doge Shore Vedi, which uh, people have a hard time verifying. And I'll show you how with angels you can actually embed into the algorithm a nice abstraction, how you can modularize it in a way that we have not seen before. I don't know which of these two are more interesting to people in the audience. Probably we shouldn't go through both so that we have time for questions. So maybe the more impressive example that shows modularization. Uh, okay, so let's, let's see how, what we can do here. So, uh, so Deutsch or Vedi is an algorithm that does essentially depth first search. The goal is to go through a directed graph and mark reachable nodes. The algorithm was invented in the context of garbage collection, which has special uh, resource requirements. When you do garbage collection, you cannot ask for extra memory because you just ran out of memory. And uh, therefore, you cannot implement depth first search and therefore the marking with an explicit stack that remembers how you need to backtrack through the depth first search. You cannot use a stack to implement the backtracking structure. So what this W does that as you go through this depth first search, you come all the way here, you remember how to backtrack by reusing pointers in the graph and making them point somewhat like this. So you do a pointer reversal, you abuse those fields in the graph, and then as you go back, you correct them. Because of course, when you are done, the graph needs to look like it was before. Uh, and this has been shown to be difficult to, to verify, and I also found it difficult to teach. It takes me 50 minutes of a recitation to explain exactly how this algorithm works. Even though on the surface the algorithm is pretty simple, now if you look at what happens here, you have a loop that iterates, and here is something that looks roughly like a push into a backtracking structure, and this is a, something that looks roughly like pop. But the details are actually quite hard to uh, discern, and the reason is that there is one memory location which, what is it? This is a, one of the children pointers. So here is a node, here is an array of children pointers, and here is the index at which you are currently. So this piece of memory on the right-hand side of this assignment serves to store the edges of the original graph that we are traversing and marking. On the left-hand side, it plays a different role. It stores the backtracking structure, the stack that will then tell you how to backtrack. And because the one memory location is overloaded in such a way, it is difficult to decouple the traversal of the algorithm, the DFS, from the backtracking structure that you need to implement DFS. 
And this is the, the crux of the complication. So it will be, uh, yes? Syntax question, are you using both equals and colon equals to the mean assignment? Yeah, this is, I do, apparently. Mm -hmm. So let me fix that. Yeah, so there are no comparis no equality comparisons here. All of it is assignments. Excuse me? Concurrent assignment. There are concurrent assignments, right. So what you have here, you have you're assigning into these three memory locations here, and you are using these three values to assign. So this piece of code you don't need to understand. We'll go through pieces that you'll have to understand, but not this one. Uh, here I just want to show what is the crux of the problem. The problem is that the traversal is intimately interlinked with implementation of the backtracking structure, which is sort of piggybacked on the graph. And showing that one location in one assignment plays two different roles sort of points to that problem. Okay, so it would be nice if we could somehow decouple these two. And uh, uh, we initially started implementing this hard algorithm with angelic non-determinism sort of ad hoc. We said, well, let's see what students can do. How can they use these angelic constructs to make the development easier? And they succeeded, they made it you know, they probably became more productive with that. We don't have any measurable data. But it didn't seem very systematic. And then I realized that maybe the way to program with angelic non-determinism is to invent some sort of new abstraction that would decouple these two things. But you as a human would actually have a hard time shoehorning that abstraction into the algorithm. But once you would specify it, the algorithm would be much clearer. So let me tell you what I mean. So when you go back here, I said, well, this looks like push and this looks like pop, but clearly it's not quite push and not quite pop. But if you invent the idea of a parasitic stack, which is what occurred to me when we were playing with this algorithm, is uh, perhaps you can re-express this algorithm with a parasitic stack. What is a parasitic stack? It's something that behaves like a stack, except it doesn't use an array to back uh, the storage the locations that the values that they actually pushed are stored on the host. The, in our car, uh, case, it's the graph that you are traversing. So it would give you the same stack interface, but it would have this parasitic channel through which it would borrow locations from the host data structure, and of course return them and restore them later because a parasite doesn't kill its host. <laughs> then it would actually uh, destroy its own uh, living. So here is the interface to this parasitic stack, which is you know, you push the value and you get it back later in the usual way. And then when you call it to push, you actually pass a few more values in, the same at the time of the pop. And in fact, you can think of it as that you are passing the environment uh, of whoever uses this push and pop to push and pop implementation so that they can actually do push and pop without having an explicit non-constant time storage. And if we did that, then the algorithm would presumably be easier to understand because you would then separate the traversal from the backtracking structure. Of course, the problem is that it is not clear how to take the parasitic idea and decide what to borrow, when to return, and how to restore the value. And in fact, I gave it to a student and he came back after a few days and said, yeah, the algorithm cannot be expressed with the parasitic stack. Because perhaps in the steady state it does push and pop, but when you are at the leaves or under the root, it does not quite behave like a stack, so you cannot re-express it this way. And here is where these angels help you. They don't help you invent the idea of a parasitic stack, but they will help you re-implement an algorithm in something like the parasitic stack, so they tell us whether such re-expression of the algorithm is possible. So here is the algorithm, so here is classical DFS with an explicit stack, which uses its own non-constant storage. So here is the push, corresponding pop, and I rewrote it to be a recurse, uh, sorry, iterative uh, algorithm rather than recursive, but this transformation from recursive to this is pretty straightforward. And now I rewrote it into this parasitic stack. So when I push, I push what I pushed before, except I add a few more values that I pass in, and these the parasitic stack can use to do its work. This is what it uses to, to borrow and, and return. Now the question is, how does the parasitic stack work? Can it actually in this DFS traversal borrows something and return it later. And so what I'll show you now is the implementation of the parasitic stack, which I claim is relatively easy to write, easier than uh, the pointer reversal DSW algorithm uh, 
And the reason why this is so that what I will write in this algorithm uses relatively local reasoning. I don't need to think in particular which location I borrow, whether it is available until the corresponding pop. I, don't, I, will, I won't reason about how to actually restore its value. This is all done by these angels. I follow, I express here only the, the strategy. So what is a parasitic stack? By the algorithm, we are allowed to use one memory location, but not an array of locations. So this is the one we have. Now here is the push code. It needs to push this value, and it receives the list of nodes as the environment, the variables from whoever uses the stack. The first thing it does, it decides by choosing from this list of nodes in which node we are borrowing the location. So here we decide in which node we borrow a, a field. Here we decide which of the children in that node we are going to borrow. And again, we do it angelically. Me, as the writer of the parasitic code, I don't need to know how the decisions is made. I don't even know whether it can be made. And I store in the node the value C that the angels decided to pick here. I'm doing that because I'm, by the algorithm, allowed to store a few bits in the node. Now, here is the value that is in the location that I'm borrowing, V. Clearly, that value needs to be remembered somehow because I need to restore it in that location at the corresponding pop. And now here is a big problem. I have two locations that I work with. The extra location E that the stack can use, and here is the location that I borrowed, right? So I have no more storage than these two things. But I really have four values that I'm working with. This is what I need to push. Here is the node that I decided to borrow from. Here is the value in that field that I borrow from, and here is the extra location. And in order for to store four values into T locations, well, I need to drop two of them. And it's not clear which of the two I can drop so that later at pop time I can actually restore them. But me, as the writer of the parasitic stack, I don't worry about it. If there is a chance the stack can work, the angels will decide which of these two locations to pick and how to store them, which of these values to pick and how to store them into these two locations. Similarly, at pop time, I receive the environment. I decide again angelically what is the node that I borrowed. Well, it better be stored in E or in one of those values that I'm getting from the arguments. Now, here is the value that I stored in that location. And now what do I have? I have four values again. I have three things that I need to compute. I need to figure out what is the value that I return. I need to restore the value in that location that's borrowed. Then I potentially need to update my constant location. And again, there are four choices and three locations. And, I, and again, angels decide how to do it. So then when I run the program and I observe it, I end up after a few iterations, a few refinements in the program that decides I am borrowing this. I am here choosing this permutation. I'm choosing this permutation here. And when it comes to the child, I'm choosing a child here that meets this invariant. I discovered that as a programmer by actually observing the trace. And once I see this invariant, I realize that I don't even need to store this because that is stored actually at the level of that, uh, at the level of the traversal. So here, what you saw is that the angels helped us do some global reasoning. It told us which location it's legal to borrow. They must not be needed until I return them. How to restore the value in those locations and how actually how to use that extra location that we have to implement what is a stack functionality and only provided guidance for it. So, and the reason the angels did work for us that they effectively, you can think of it clairvoyant uh, look ahead in the execution. They knew which locations will be needed and when and therefore they were able to show us a demonstration of how this angelic stack would work. So are there other ways to turn this around? Well, this is what you saw first. Sort of partial program, it takes correctness criteria and partial program and a completion gives you a program. Then the completion was an angelic demonstration. But there are other ways how you could do it. It's possible that starting from some demonstrations and from completions, you actually obtain a partial program. And the reason why this may be interesting is that when you actually program for a company rather than in an open source environment, you need to be careful how much code you borrow before your code gets polluted. But perhaps your demonstrations can be snippets of the codes, and this is your entire program that you are writing, and from that you can synthesize partial programs that you can then use to synthesize your programs. And then it's difficult to claim that your code actually contains code that you borrowed from 
code out there. Instead, it will be synthesized from the partial programs that were obtained in such a process. So what did I try to show you? That partial programs could communicate programmer inside, at least in some domains, and that the suitable algorithm will then complete the mechanics. And that there are ideas for figuring out how to ask the programmer in various ways, or the end user, for, for what is the desired behavior, and how to capture the early insight, how to actually get ideas what the steps of the algorithm should be uh, when you are not ready to write that partial program. And the application could be uh, diverse, perhaps in end-user programming, in developing interactive websites. It may be possible to take the task of programming and decompose it too into something that is an insight and the mechanics, and have the mechanics synthesized. And hopefully that will be possible because we now know that the specifications do not need to be typical correctness specifications such as assertions, but these could be demonstrations that partially specify what the program should be doing. So that's all I have to say. So this is all, all really cool stuff and all seems very compelling uh, when, when, when you show how you can speed up these very challenging programming situations. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how usable this is in the real world, how, how programmers really think about these things, and if this fits in with their model of trying to solve these really hard problems. So whether it's usable depends on the domain. In some of the domains we looked at, it is more usable than in others. So for example, in high performance <coughs> programming with matrices, sort of the stencil computations you do on a GPU, it's easy to fit this because uh, there you have sort of regularly structured code and the things that are difficult become the loop bounds and the array indices. And so it is clear often to you as a programmer what the code needs to look like, but coming up with those is difficult. Uh, in these concurrent data structures, it's hard to say yet, we don't have enough experience, but it sort of looks like you saw here from the example that <coughs> you have a roughly sequential code and then you need to figure out what sort of locking you want. And you need to specify enough ingredients for that locking. And there we sort of believe that it could work as well. Um, the one thing that speaks in our favor is that you are giving the programmer a tool where he actually controls what, did the what is the synthesized code. If you want to use a particular implementation low-level trick which they care about, they can express it. This is much more difficult to do when you are generating the code from transformations, from a specification that you transform, because how do you guide it towards desired implementation? If there is an implementation you want to see in that code, you really need to first be able to express it in terms of the transformation. That usually takes a long time. Uh, on the other hand, some domains, it's not clear that the programmer can do the clear separation between insight and mechanics. And often uh, what people told us that you don't even know how to start writing that sketch. But we are hoping that this angelic approach, which is also gradual, has refinement, can actually help you in that step. But yes, sort of from the HCI point of view, the question is, when the programmer thinks about the implementation, or maybe first about the algorithm, are the queries that he's asking himself easily expressible as partial programs, right? Sometimes yes, sometimes not, but really that's what our research is this, uh, this year and a few years ahead. Figure out how one can naturally express these queries as tiny programs, look in the answers in demonstrations, pose more queries with assertions, which essentially constrain angelic choices, and, and uh, other ideas that we have in mind. Um. Scott. Will your program ever come back with a couple of different options? Like, hello, Roz, this is your computer. You could go path A or you could go path B. Which do you prefer? Or, and the, the second part of that question is, are there ever times where <coughs> the program will say, well, I mostly have it figured out for you, but I need one more piece of information? Well, so the first question is whether there are multiple <coughs> choices. And let me divide the answer into synthesis of programs and synthesis of demonstrations. When you synthesize the programs, yeah, there could be multiple choices. Usually when we write those sketches, that's not the case. Usually it's, it's constrained enough that th when there are multiple choices, they are isomorphic from all purposes. Sometimes not, and sometimes you actually get multiple algorithms expressed. In the case of matrix computation, they may traverse in various ways. But this is actually what you want. You may generate these alternatives and then sort of auto-tune among them, picking one that has good performance. So uh, 
A bigger problem and sort of more interesting from the research point of view is when you synthesize demonstrations. Because there the angels have the power to, yes, run the execution to the end successfully, but they use their clairvoyant power to make the execution really crazy. So they give you a correct execution, but it may not correspond to the algorithm that you want or to any algorithm for that matter. Because the angels can provide values that correspond to non-computable functions after all, right? So there we have ideas on how to attack it. And the, the, the solution is roughly this. When you see hundreds of thousands of traces, which you actually see in this DSW parasitic stag idea, you can actually break them into equivalence classes based what we call you know, uh, tentatively angelic entanglement. So what does that mean? You have a trace where multiple angels were executed. If those guys, these angels, collaborate to give you a correct execution, that's usually a bad thing, because then you will need to introduce some metastate into the program so that the decision of this can be communicated there. If they don't communicate, you say they are not entangled. And how do you determine whether they are? Well, if you can flip the value of this angel and you don't have to correct any other angel, then they are independent. And so by doing that, you can break traces into categories and discover which of them are sort of clean with low levels of entanglement. And those likely correspond to the algorithm. The others likely abuse the clairvoyant power. So that's our plan for dealing with that. But yeah, absolutely, it is a problem. The good thing is that as you understand more about how the clairvoyant angels abuse the freedom you gave them, you put in a few assertions, you constrain their choices and the number of traces goes down. And in fact, the refinement process that I talked about is a process of forcing the angels gradually to give you an algorithm that you want, rather than the other crazy executions. But there clearly is a need for some post-processing of the space of uh, demonstrations. Um, I found the prospector thing really interesting. Uh, there's a built-in uh, API suggestion tool, I guess, in Eclipse. So how similar is that to prospect? Does it also use like a have and want fit? So well, I, I do, didn't check the last version, but uh, what was there recently? The way that works is essentially uh, if you have a cursor at the position right after a dot, the field selection dot, well, what does the tool know? The tool knows the type of that expression on the left, perhaps a variable, the static type. And then it goes into the API based on the type and tells you, okay, given the type, you can call these methods or select those fields. It ranks them by sort of usage pattern it has, it has shown. But essentially, it only tells you if you have your expression dot of a particular type, this is the expression or the sort of, sorry, function name that you can see behind the dot. But it doesn't do any search across some sort of graph of the API. So it's much more local that way. Uh, but much more predictable. So programmers find it easier to use than our tool, which they found it useful. We improved productivity. But um, I think more HCI ideas are for how to interface to such semantic search engines. Well, thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.